Hello, everybody, and welcome back to your favorite film podcast, The Average Film Enjoyer. I am one of your co-hosts, Trey, and I am joined today by uh, my other co-host, Evan, and we are also joined today by a very special guest that we are so happy to have on, uh, writer and director, Mr. Eric England. Eric, how are you doing today? Oh, man, I am wonderful. How are you guys doing? I'm, yeah, I think we're both doing excellent. Yeah. Uh, really <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we're super excited to have you on today. Um, you're the I'm first kind of here. like director, writer kind of person we've had on. So oh, that's cool. super exciting. I'm honored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me and Trey were going back and forth last night. I'm like, oh, what do we ask him? <laughs> yeah. <All that>. yeah. <laughs> My uh, brother, he's a, he's a radio producer. And so he interviews oh, cool. people all the time. And I was like, yeah. What do I do? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Ask me so, anything. Yeah, for sure. Usually, first thing I want to ask, Ooh. usually when we have guests on, we'll have them do like uh, their top four on Letterbox, just so yeah. our listeners can kind of get to know what kind of movies they enjoy, what they're into. Sure. Um, so, and you said you have your top four um, that you want to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to uh, hand it over to you and let you kind of talk about your top four. Cool. I, I think my, my top four um, to some people might be um, a little uh, vanilla latte, um, a little basic. Um, I, I don't I don't have the most like obscure taste. I, I, I kind of appreciate the name of average film enjoyer because like I grew up in Arkansas and I just watched what, you know, coming from Arkansas. It's the Bible Belt. It's um, you know, there's a lot of restrictions around a lot of things. And so I just saw whatever mainstream pop culture gave us, you know, so I didn't really discover obscure movies until I moved to L.A. Um, my top four are David Fincher's Seven is probably my favorite movie of all time. I, I think it movie. is just I think it's flawless. I think it is absolutely flawless. Um, I love Parasite, um, the, the yeah. Korean film, um, the Coen Brothers Fargo um, is is in there. And then uh, Jordan Peele's. Jordan Peele's Get Out. Those, Those are, are four, four amazing picks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like, yeah. They're... I feel like no, Fargo is a really slept on Coen Brothers film. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, oh my God, that um, movie is so good. Specifically, John, like, obviously you have great performances from William H. Macy, Steve yeah. Buscemi, Francis McDormand, but one performance that I love from that movie, John Carroll Lynch, who never really it's has- great the lead in any film but he's always like a little like even in like another fincher film he's in zodiac, zodiac he has like yeah. three scenes but he always makes the movie better just by being like a little side role i love him especially in far have you seen um a, a a little indie horror movie called the invitation yes Dude, that movie is so he's, fucking good he's great yeah he's great that movie that. is insane um yeah oh i love that i love that movie um yeah. But yeah, those are great four picks. Yeah, um, I have. We were talking about uh, David Fincher, like when the killer came out, and yeah. everyone's dropping their rankings. And I rewatched Seven, and I kept hearing, "Oh, Seven is so fucked up," and like, I don't want to rewatch it. I love that movie. I think it has insane so rewatchability, good. and it just the yeah. pacing is so good, and it's just like, yeah. even though you know what's coming, you just get excited yeah. for it every time. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It's, like I'm, yeah. I, I, I love. I don't know if you've heard the story behind it, but when David Fincher got sent the script, my wife, um, who who writes and produces with me, um, now, um, she read the original version of the script, or not the original version of the script, but like, um, a, a widely released version of the script, which was like a rewrite. And David Fincher got sent the original script, mm -hmm. which had the ending that's in it now. And she was like, what is this shit with like a dog and a church or something like that? And I was like, oh, you must have read the rewrite. But I love that David Fincher got the original oh. version and was like, they were like, no, we sent you the wrong version. He was like, no, I'm making this version. If, if they <laughs> want to do that. anything else other than this ending with the head in the box, like I'm not touching this. Like, and I just that's think it's cool. so great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, um, and on the topic of David Fincher, I know me and Evan talked about this a couple weeks ago, and it's still fresh on my mind, so I like talking about it to as many people as possible. Uh, <laughs> because I just watched Mindhunter for the first time. Which, it's great. Uh, and I think that might be, like, obviously, movie, just movies. I think Social Network is my favorite oh, Fincher project. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's really uh, good. But 
I think Mindhunter might be like my favorite anything he has ever done. And I want to ask wow. you your opinion on, or, or even if you've seen it, um, mm -hmm. because obviously there's also some horror elements in that yeah. show, even though it's not like monsters, ghosts, demons, stuff like that. Obviously, yeah. you got like all these interviews with Ed Kemper and Charlie Manson mm -hmm. that are just yeah. like super tense and horrifying it, scenes. Yeah. Um, and I want to ask you your opinion on that show if you've seen it. Yeah, I, I have seen it. Um, I, you know, it took me a minute to get into it at first because it's it's slow. It's very methodical. And I I I remember distinctly the opening of um of Mindhunter where the guy has like the hostage and 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 mm -hmm. commits suicide. And I just remember thinking, like, what a fucking way to open a TV show. Like yeah. it's hilarious, it's dark, it's twisted, it's messed up. And and I'm I'm fascinated. Obviously, the the kind of um, you know understanding of the architecture of like the FBI is really fascinating. Like anytime you're dealing with like you know, there's almost like a Silence of the Lambs quality to Mindhunter, where it's like you're you're interviewing serial killers to get insight to catch other serial killers, yeah. and I, that's really fascinating. I agree with you. The Ed Kemper interviews and stuff are probably my favorite of the show because it's like. I'm I'm just on edge with everything that guy's saying and and the way he's just so calmly detailing his crimes and talking about you know what serial killers get out of the act of, of murder and all of that stuff is just insane you know and it it is it is just as riveting as any true crime documentary in my opinion but better because it's it's dramatized by one of the greatest filmmakers that has ever done it david fincher so yeah i'm, I'm a huge fan anytime david fincher's behind a camera i'm there yeah i need to yeah. watch it i haven't seen it yet I yeah dude it's i i was telling evan because uh i watch well especially now i'm looking for a job right now but now that i'm unemployed I watch an obscene amount of movies and yeah. there was a day, there was a day or two where I didn't log anything because I was binging all of Mindhunter. Yeah. You watched it crazy fast. It's I like, and that's like my favorite genre uh, besides horror is that like thriller, like murder, like that kind yeah. of vibe, which Fincher yeah. excels at. Um, yeah. And I, I just like felt psychological like psychological horror. Yeah, oh, I just felt like that show was just made for me. Um, but, uh, obviously, uh, again, we are here to talk about your movies and your films that me and Evan... I'd rather talk about Fincher. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, me and Evan have both really enjoyed uh, diving into your filmography. Um, Thank you. And um, I wanted to ask, like, what, what um, led you to becoming a filmmaker, like... How, how did you get into that? Um, what's kind of the story behind uh, you getting into making horror films? I, I had a little bit of a kind of a Jim Carrey and the cable guy upbringing um, where I, I grew up watching the television. You know, the television was always my best friend. And um, I, I, I had birthday parties at movie theaters. Um, I, I was just always a, a big movie watcher as a kid. My dad was a big movie watcher. Um, my parents were really young when they had me. My mom was 18 and my dad being, you know, 21, um, was big into movies. You know, I was growing up in the, in the early nine, late eighties, early nineties. And, um, you know, Pulp Fiction was the hot movie in the early nineties. So my dad wanted to see Pulp Fiction and, and thankfully he didn't know you shouldn't show kids, you know, <laughs> gangster movies. And, um, so I, I, I was kind of raised on a steady diet of, of R rated cinema in the nineties. And, um, that kind of imprinted on my brain, you know, probably um, I, I, I saw this great quote from uh, William Friedkin, the director of The Exorcist, and, and it said something to the effect. I'm going to butcher this quote, but it was something to the effect of if I didn't grow up to be a, a movie director, I would have been a serial killer. <laughs> and, and it's like <laughs> I've always thought like, you know, that's that's hilarious because like, yeah, I think you kind of have to be a little warped by society to, to want to like tell, tell stories and be a filmmaker. And, and yeah, you gotta be interested in, and in the things that people aren't talking about, you know, cause those always make for the great, the greatest movies and the greatest stories. So yeah, I think growing up in kind of a, uh, repressed culture, you know, in Arkansas, uh, and, and seeing cinema that kind of showed me there's a great big world out there. 
Mm -hmm. um, I was fascinated by it. And, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've become really fascinated about the origins of storytelling. And, you know, it's like our ancestors were doing cave paintings and, you know, gathering around the campfire and telling stories. And, and I'm fascinated by that because it's, it's, you know, that's, that's the origin of where we all come from. So I think as I get older and, and get into my career a little more, it's like that. I'm always trying to tap into that. I think that there's something so human. It's why we're here talking today. You know, you guys love movies. I love movies and, and I can talk about movies all day. So growing up, I was like, what do I want to do for the rest of my life, you know, you got to pick a job, you got to do something. And I'm like, I, I want to make movies. I, I think that sounds like a blast. And I didn't know how to make movies. I'd never touched a camera before. I could barely, you know, I, I, I was a terrible student. Um, I couldn't do a book report. So I, I, as soon as I could, uh, when I was, uh, 18 or 19, I, I signed up to go to film school and move to LA as quickly as I could. And, uh, and that kind of set me off on my journey. Yeah. Um, I can really relate to that kind of, uh, I don't know, you used a word that I found, like that kind of repressed culture. I grew up like yeah. very sheltered Christian kid. Yeah. Um, so same, I same. grew up watching, um, I grew up mostly watching Marvel and pretty like, like the big blockbusters. And I, until yeah. the last couple years, I didn't really get into like, I, and I don't want to say that Marvel isn't cinema. I, I think it has its place. It has it. It will always hold a special place in my heart. I think it's a blast. And I think it. Yeah. But I didn't really get into like your Quentin Tarantino's, your William Friedkin's, who has slowly become one of my favorites, your Stanley yeah. Kubrick's until the past couple years. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I totally relate with that. Evan, I don't know if you can relate with that yeah. at all. Uh, yes and no. So I was in that vein when my mom was home when she would go away for a weekend my dad would say i remember this so clearly i was probably eight or eight years old he says boys i have a brother he says boys we're having chicken wings for dinner and we're watching die hard and I <laughs> yeah like, that's awesome i can go like that's amazing. yeah and uh so i had like a lot of cool memories my dad i remember he showed me air force one when i was like nine years old nice. maybe and gary oldman shook me to my core terrifying mm -hmm. villain and he's great yeah so there was this big sheltered effect like i wasn't allowed to watch family guy or stuff like that yeah. and you know it was kind of just relegated to like spongebob and the symptoms simpsons and one big thing for me that really propelled me into movies where i could respect them as like this is art is my yeah. grandma when I would go away for a weekend, she showed me uh, The Sixth Sense, and my mm. mom would never let me watch it because it was a horror movie, and we watched yeah. it, and I thought it was amazing. I was like, yeah. it's the first plot twist I've ever seen in my entire life. This is crazy. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we watched like Billy Elliot, and she got me into musicals, and then we watched The Hurt Locker. Mm, uh, I was born good. in 99, so like, I was, I don't know, I was pretty young, and yeah it was a rough movie to sit through. Like there's that scene where they're digging the bomb out of the kid's stomach. And she's like, you mm -hmm. should look away for this, but she would never shy away from showing me movies. And even when I was older, if there was like a more obscure movie playing at like a retro theater, I would call her and be like, yep, let's go. And she would always say yes. So I had like influences into more, more, cool movies outside of just yeah. the like vanilla stuff early yeah. on but it was it it took a bit of time to get there like my dad would show me remember we had terminator 2 on vhs hell and yeah the scene where sarah connor's holding that metal fence as the like apocalypse comes through and she's like yeah. vaporized to her skeleton shook me yeah. to my core it scared the shit out of me but it's still like, <laughs> yeah this movie's awesome so yeah uh yeah it was um, it was a mixture of both, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, but and that kind of transitions me into one of your first uh, like feature films, Madison County. Um, yeah, me and Evan, I think both really enjoyed this. Uh, I loved it because it fa had this very like seventies and eighties like slasher type vibe, yeah, yeah. like a uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. 
is the always yeah. the one that comes to, it's comes to mind. Movie. Especially mm-hmm. with this film, I felt uh, a lot of that movie in this film, just the yeah. style and the setting. Um, so I just want to ask you, how was it um, filming? I don't know if this was your first. The, on Letterbox it says this is your first, but I don't know if this mm-hmm. was like your first movie. Um, how was that experience of like filming your first, close to your first feature length film uh especially a film like this uh that uh required obviously a lot of like in the makeup department and the special effects department with like these gnarly kills which might i say are awesome especially the one uh the guy gets the handle of the bat through his baseball bat yeah oh my gosh dude that was awesome Uh, (laughs) um so i just want to ask you like what was that experience like filming this film um, it was a blast, you know, I, it was, it was, um, I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed by the movie these days. I, I, I saw it not too long ago and I was like, ah, it's like watching, you know, watching old home movies or something. But, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it's, it's very much a backyard movie. Like we shot it at my grandpa's house. Um, I was obviously very influenced by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, you know, in Arkansas where I grew up, the college mascot which is effectively the pro mascot of arkansas is the arkansas razorback so the pig head kind of had some synergy there um yeah i i was just really um i i as a kid in high school like i said i was thinking what what do i want to grow up and do i was thinking about where should i go to college what should i do and um i had i'd started researching filmmaking and learned that um one of the biggest influences on me at the time was um eli roth's cabin fever i i watched the I had watched, I had bought the DVD and I watched the behind the scenes and it looked like such a blast. And I was like, man, this guy's just out in the woods with his friends making horror movies and covering people in blood. And like, this, this looks like a blast. Like, how do I do this? And so that, that really just kind of became the mandate. I was like, how do I make a horror movie in the woods with my friends, you know? And so, um, I had started writing, the movie. Uh, it wasn't my first true feature film. I, I shot a movie called Hostile Encounter um, in my mom's backyard, not my grandpa's. Um, <laughs> that uh, I, you know, I'm I'm old enough to where like uh, you couldn't even get an IMDb um, a credit without going to like a film festival. So that was how I got my first IMDb credit was submitting Hostile Encounter to a film festival in like Wisconsin or something. We actually got in. I couldn't believe it. The movie wasn't even finished. Um, and, uh, and it screened. I, n- I never went to the premiere or anything like that. Um, so that movie is, is lost to the world. It's, it's somewhere on a hard drive. I don't know if I'll ever release it, but, um, but we, we shot that first. So that's my first true feature film. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then Madison County was, uh, I, the guy who shot hostile encounter with me, I'd shown it to him and he, you know, it's so funny. He was like, man, I was behind the camera the whole time. And I thought this is going to be a nightmare. Like I have no idea what we're doing. And then I showed him the footage edited together and he was like, holy shit, this is kind of a real movie. And, uh, he had come to me and he was like, if I could get you like a little bit of money, cause we made hostile encounter for like five grand and Madison County ended up costing like 70 grand. And um, and so that was kind of the mandate was like, OK, if if Texas Chainsaw Massacre costs like one hundred and fourteen or one hundred and forty thousand dollars or something like that back in 1974, maybe we could make a movie for like 70 grand. And um, and so we did. Yeah, it was it was just kind of a fun experience. We called it Camp Madison County. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the actors in the movie um, aren't from L.A., but they're people I met while living in L.A. And um, and, you know, that was their first time in in arkansas and i remember them landing at the airport there's a regional airport and they were like i'm pretty sure we just landed in like a cow pasture and i was like you kind of did and um (laughs) so they yeah there's a lot of culture shock and and it was um it was a brutal shoot we had no idea what we were doing we had no schedule um we were literally just running around ah we should film this scene we should do this and ah it's raining now so you know let's just shoot and it was it was a little bit of a nightmare but um the movie ended up um, coming together pretty well. We ended up uh, premiering at um, Screamfest, which is the biggest uh, horror film festival in North America, I believe. It's where Paranormal Activity was discovered. Um, and it got a really good reception there. We were the first movie since Paranormal Activity to receive an encore screening, which is really cool. Like the the crowd demanded that they do another screening. So we had a sold out premiere and then did another screening. 
um, which went really well. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was really cool. It was, I, I have great fond memories of that time, but it was, uh, like I said, when I look back on it, I'm like, oh man, I just made like a pig headed slasher movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's why I love it so much. And that's why I love, I mean, this type of horror so much is, especially if yeah. you go back into the seventies and eighties, um, this type of like be real horror that, I mean, there was a lot of parts of this that I just found so funny and so goofy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I think that is such, like, the, the, the goofiness and the cheesiness, and I think it works so well, especially here. Um, but you go back and look at, like, the Evil Dead movies or your Frank yeah. Henenlotter movies, um, stuff like that. And I think that's what I like so much about this one is because, like, sure, you have your very, like what i think people are calling it elevated horror now so you have like yeah, yeah. your yeah, heredit that. your hereditaries your get outs your stuff like that but yeah. i f feel like they're this type of horror this type of like campy cheesy horror was lost a long time ago you don't see it as much as you used to yeah and I that's mean, what i yeah, love evil dead uh the new evil deads yeah, yeah yeah um and that i think that's what i love so much about it is that it's like tapping into this great subgenre of horror that we don't get mm -hmm. to see too much of anymore because it's just not as appreciated. Um, yeah. So I think that's what I love so much about it. Um, but to get into specifics, I want to ask, um, and this will kind of lead us into our conversation about contracted. How um, how important do you think that like special effects, makeup, and all that stuff is? to a horror movie like this because obviously you want to make the kills look as gnarly as possible which i think yeah. d you you really did well here uh um, yeah i was i was thinking to myself man this movie looks really good yeah I, and no, you thanks. said it was your one of your first and i was like genuinely surprised by that yeah no, it, i think it looks yeah excellent. before um, we get into that track i would just love to oh, say yeah. like one thing i uh my favorite horror movie of all time is the texas chainsaw massacre it Hell I yeah. only watched it for the first time during the like quarantine. Oh wow. It it was fucking amazing. Like I genuinely yeah. was just the the dinner table scene is crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. so tense. And reading yeah. up on how they filmed it in this like crazy yeah, heat brutal. that everyone was genuinely yeah. suffering. It really yeah. kind of propelled me into this like I love horror movies set in these like rural towns like yeah. evil dead or, or like these just abandoned villages i watched uh the house yeah. of wax the remake i mean yeah i, I love that movie original super yeah. fun like i love these small town horror films because you get these super creepy twisted locals and this one has that the the old yeah. lady you yeah. know and all this like that's something i think is super entertaining and yeah yeah evil dead is keeping it going too and like yeah it is a genre that's kind of lost in the 2000s though yeah i i think it's just oversaturated i mean that was yeah. one of the things like when i was getting ready to make the movie um i mean look like i was very inspired by texas chainsaw massacre obviously yeah. and um if you like um if you like the House of Wax remake, I highly recommend a movie called uh, Tourist Trap if you've not seen it. Oh, I haven't um, seen that. I'll check it, it out. It's, it's uh, effectively the House of Wax remake is a remake of Tourist Trap because the House oh, of okay. the original House of Wax is nothing like the remake. <laughs> yeah. um, Stephen, Stephen King has famously said um, that Tourist Trap, I believe, is his favorite horror movie. It's him or Quentin cool. Tarantino. I can't remember. Sick. Um, I think I think Tarantino said My Bloody Valentine. But um, the uh, yeah, the Tourist Trap movie is, is um, kind of in that same world really creepy um small town horror and i mean for me it was just that's all i knew i i you know yeah. when i was growing up i had never even been on an airplane like i didn't get on an airplane so i was a teenager like 17 or 18 and right. um so small town small town creepy you know vibes was all i knew i going to my grandpa's as a kid we would you know it was a two-hour drive effectively and um, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere. I, I had some, uh, literally, like I said, my, my first movie is called hostile encounter because I had had a lot of hostile encounters out in the middle <laughs> of the woods with, 
random hillbillies that were like, what the hell are you doing on my land? And I was like, oh shit, like I, I could get shot. And, um, you know, and so it was, it was a terrifying notion. And then, um, you know, where my grandpa lives is actually called Madison County. That's where the name came from. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, you know, and, and I think there, you know, obviously the Texas chainsaw mask, I was like, oh, they put Texas in the title. I should use, you know, the local area (laughs) in, in the name. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the idea came from just kind of having these hostile encounters and having these, um, these stories told to me by my grandpa, my grandpa would tell me the craziest things. And so when we were shooting the movie, we actually ran into some hostile locals and people gave my grandpa some shit after the movie came out, I heard. And, you know, he was like, you can't shoot. If you do a sequel, you can't do it here. Um, so there, there was a there was a I, I think, you yeah. know, it was kind of weird, too, because the people were like, what are you saying about us in Arkansas? And I'm like, I'm from Arkansas. Like, I'm talking about me, too. You know, so um, so it was it was kind of a weird thing. But um, to yeah. the special effects, um, we actually were really, really, really fortunate. So, again, I, I had never made anything. I I'd done like a killer clown movie when I was in film school and, you know, ripped some people's heads off and stuff and had some cheesy effects in that. But, um, I had never really tried to do anything that I considered like really brutal and, you know, kind of a graphic kill. And, um, we, we, we lucked out so much on the special effects. We had a guy named Rob Hall who, who tragically passed a few years ago, RIP Rob Hall, but he, um, he, he had done, um, a lot of big Hollywood movies. He was, he was a big, big effects guy and a director himself. And, uh, we were introduced, um, I forgot how we got introduced, but, um, but like, you know, basically he, he had a meeting with me and he was like, look, man, I, I really admire what you're trying to do. And I, I, I know, you know, you got the deck stacked against you because making movies is hard. And he was like, we'll go ahead and do your whole movie. Um, and he gave us a great rate and, and that's why the effects are so good. You know, that's, he did the pig mask for us. Cause like we could, that pig mask probably cost more than the entire movie, you know, and, and he just <laughs> completely hooked us up. I have this really cool picture on my phone of um dean cundy the cinematographer of john carpenter's halloween and back to the future and jurassic park playing with the pig head at the special effects studio because like he was just yeah yeah like so he was like sending me updates like hey this is how the mask is coming along and i'm like this is the coolest thing ever and um (laughs) you know to me i was just thinking i was like i'm just gonna keep the camera on this pig head the whole time and it sucks because now when i watch the movie i'm like i should have had the pig head in there more um, but, um, but yeah, the, the effects were, um, you know, we, we had this great, uh, effects guy named Joe who came from almost human, almost human was the effects house. And, uh, Joe was a massive, massive fan of, um, of evil dead. And he was like, yeah, let's like spray blood everywhere and let's do this. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we just had so much fun. Like it, it, I remember while we were filming the movie, we just couldn't wait for the effects, but the tragedy when you're shooting low budget horror movies is you can't, you don't have money for like extra clothes and extra this and extra that. Mm. So like the, the blood and stuff always gets saved till the end. And then, you know, when you're shooting a movie like this, you're shooting in sunlight. So then the sun's going down and, um, the, uh, the scene where, uh, uh, the, I think her character name is Jenna, but the actress's name is Natalie when she's getting like axed in the back. Yeah. That literally, literally Damien, He's swinging the axe one day, and then when he pulls the axe out of her back, it's on a completely different day because we were running out of so, so like we shot that scene over like three different days. It's insane, and um, so that scene so, was yeah, really great. A- the 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 noise when the pig head just kicks her right in the ankle, you hear the bones break. Ah, oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, that's, that's some of the most fun, you know, stuff to do and to make. And then, you know, I, like I said, I have trouble watching the movie, but I'm glad people enjoy it. It's, it's a, uh, it really is kind of like, uh, you know, was, you, you look back on that stuff and it's like, it's a passion project because you're making it with blood, sweat and tears. We had no money. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are the days that I wish I could go back to and, and, and relive and, and, you know, maybe one day I'll do another slasher movie, small town backwoods horror movie. I, I have some ideas. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm creeping up on 40 now and now I'm like, do I want to go back and do that? But, um, I, I think that there's, there's too much like comedy in, in these movies now there's like horror yeah. comedy and horror comedies are great. I love horror comedies 
but I, to me, I, I think the, the, you know, those movies work the best, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre works because it's just unsettling. You know, it's yeah. like you watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and it's like, you feel dirty, you feel grimy. Yeah. And it's like, these kids are just like moseying around and exploring abandoned buildings. And then suddenly Leatherface runs out with a hammer and hits someone. And then it's like, holy shit, what the hell just happened? And like that kind of catch you off guard stuff is, is what I'm really interested in. Cause it's like, yeah, it's scary. It's really scary. Especially yeah. here in America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really yeah. love, uh, really quick. You mentioned cabin fever. I love yeah. that movie. Yeah. I always think of cabin fever, like the scene when she goes to shave her leg and all the skin. Peels yeah. Out. And, yeah. uh, it is a nasty ass shot. That movie, like, I don't, I love Eli Roth. I think some of his movies are better than others, but sure. I find that he goes, he has very entertaining movies that very quickly yeah. get into that Texas Chainsaw Massacre where you feel yeah. disgusting because, uh, like, it just, his characters are fun to watch, but then you get the nastiest gore and we'll get into it with contracted but you yeah. know that level of disgust in the gore is like a really interesting path to go down that i respect yeah. and really enjoy uh <laughs> and we'll get into it when we talk about the maggot scene later uh, yeah but yeah, but yeah. Then, like the same thing with eli roth he just like i mean if you go at uh uh hostile i got hostile yeah. um I got that as a DVD in like this mystery box I ordered off of eBay um, uh, a cool. while back. And the scene where he cuts the guy's ank back of his ankles, the like Achilles his Achilles, tendons. Oh my and then God. he tries to stand up and you see his foot like yeah. split. Oh, one of the grossest things I have ever. It's just, oh, he, so, some of his so, stuff is uh, so gnarly. So when I was in high school, I actually tore my Achilles tendon and, oh. um, that, yeah. And that seed has messed with me ever since I was a kid. Um, yeah, I actually lived that nightmare. My, I took my Achilles tendon tore and I had to have surgery as in a wheelchair for a few months. Like it, it was oh. a whole thing. So yeah, I, I, I know that horror intimately. Yeah. That scene always gets me. Yeah. Um, I really love but, that feeling of just like pure disgust because you yeah. sit there and you're like, this is awful to look at, but I'm having a really good time. Yeah, yeah it's so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, to get into uh, Contracted, uh, this is the one um, that Brett, um, who we've had on the pod, uh, he love Brett. really, yeah. I think Brett, Brett is a ginormous fan of um, I liked this quite a bit Evan did as well um oh, cool thank you yeah obviously here we get uh the, the well, I like to call it like an ST uh like uh, like the same thing in it follow you get the ST yeah. Yeah, the yeah. sexually transmitted demon but in this it's more like <laughs> an Evan said an STZ a sexually transmitted yeah. zombie yeah um, yeah so and they're I mean, gosh, some of the scenes in this movie, this is um, very heavy of the influences of body horror here. Yeah, yeah Trey, um, Trey texted me and he said, I need you to watch this movie. We're going to interview Eric. And I looked yeah. at Letterboxd and it says, after being drugged and raped at a party, a young woman contracts what she thinks is an STD, but it becomes yeah. something much worse. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, yeah, it's what gnarly. am I in for? Yeah. And <laughs> I, I was locked in, but yeah yeah it's i mean it's gnarly and it's i i loved it so much there's so many scenes here that like i said earlier i was like i had to pause and like compose myself because i was like <laughs> this is insane um in like the best possible um and um here oh no um, i think i'm losing obviously you from okay i got you oh yeah. i think you're go. lagging okay try. oh i am shit uh no you're good you're good okay cool uh i want to ask you like what was the filming this like a more of a body <laughs> horror 
than filming like more of a slasher was there any like huge differences about the filmmaking process for you is there one like you enjoyed more uh what what, what were like the big differences of doing these two different type of sub genres yeah um I, I mean i think that you know contracted costs fifty thousand dollars a lot of people don't know that it was a real it's the cheap it's the cheapest movie i've ever made um we shot it in la for 15 days so it was it was a lot more um it was a little more relaxed than shooting Madison County. Cause you're not like outside with the, but Madison County literally was like camping, you know? Um, and shooting, shooting contracted was we're shooting in our own apartments and um, shooting in friends apartments. And, and, you know, it was my, uh, it was my first time working with um, actors who had uh, some, some notoriety, uh, you know, Caroline Williams, who plays uh, Samantha's mom and contracted was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Um, and uh, obviously Matt Mercer, who's in contracted, who plays Riley was in uh, Madison County, he gets the baseball bat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was, it was a different, it was my third movie. Um, so I had a little bit more experience. Um, I knew a little bit more about what I wanted to do with the camera. Um, I knew how I wanted to construct, construct the story. Um, the, it's funny, you mentioned the, the leg shaving scene in cabin fever. That was cabin fever was a huge influence on contracted. Um, I actually know Eli. Um, so it's, it's, it's been fun to kind of like, I, I, you know, ironically, um, this is always weird. Cause, uh, you know, when contracted came out, a lot of people, um, described it as Cronenberg esque. And I actually hadn't seen a lot of David Cronenberg's movies before I made contracted. Um, I'd seen like scanners and, and maybe Videodrome, but, um, I hadn't seen a lot of uh, a lot of his his you know I hadn't seen the brood I hadn't seen shivers I hadn't seen um, a lot of his earlier stuff and um, and and so the the body horror genre was kind of uh, new to me I was I was uh, hanging out with um, Simon Barrett who wrote Your Next uh, he plays B J <sighs> and Contracted um, and I, yeah and and I was really influenced by a lot of those guys they were. Um, you know, they were doing some really interesting low budget indie films and I was like, okay, cool. Like I, I was curious about the festival circuit. I I'm, you know, it's ironic cause I, I wanted contracted to be more of a festival movie. It didn't really get into any major festivals. It went to Sitges, which is uh, a great, great festival and one of the best. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, my, my goal was to try and like do like an art house horror movie and it still ended up being this like gross out movie. And, and I, I think I underestimated, I kind of have a dark twisted sense of humor. And I think I underestimated how um, polarizing and transgressive the movie would be, um, you know, especially we live in very sensitive times. So when you talk about, you know, a character who, who is uh, date raped at a, at a party, like everyone's like, Oh shit, you know? And, and I was like, you know, this is real world horror to me. Like the same way I was making Madison County. And I was like, you go onto someone's land and they have the right to shoot you. You know, you go to a party, people are roofing people. Like it fucking sucks. It's a scary world out there. And so yeah. to me, I was just trying to, to be very honest about, um, you know, what, what happens in the drama of the story and then taking that drama to extreme heights and, and just taking it to the worst imaginable outcomes. And um, yeah, it follows is obviously mentioned a lot alongside contracted. I think we came out before it follows pretty sure we did. Yeah. Um, but, um, Freaking but yeah, you know, it's ripping you off. God. <laughs> I know, man. I know. <laughs> I was um, going to say that 2013 gave us two vomiting blood into people's mouth scenes with this and evil dead. 2013 remake oh shit Even oh yeah came out this year too that yeah year too. it came out yeah. the same year it made me laugh i was just thinking of it yeah yeah um no 2013 was a really good year for horror i think and um it uh yeah i i i I, you know, it's weird. I haven't made a horror movie since contracted. Um, you know, I, I love making horror movies and, and it's what I grew up on, but, um, you know, the business is really weird and, you know, there's, there's good people in horror and there's pieces of shit in, in, in horror. Right. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I contracted holds a special place in my heart. It's, it's obviously well and above the most successful movie of my career. And, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I love that people really enjoy it. Um, for me, it was just an absolute blast i i love and adore najara townsend who plays sam in the movie she's great um that that whole experience was was just kind of like finding a film family you know and and we 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 had a really really great time making that movie it was like i said we had no money so we were just pure 
it was just pure creativity, you know, and I think that's why so many people have responded to it. But it was it was uh, making it compared to Madison County was uh, it was a breeze. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. One uh, thing I need to say, the poster for this movie is so fucking good. No, oh, cool. Thank you. Samantha with the eye tweaked out. Yeah, the mouth is all. Oh, I was already I saw the poster and I was like, I'm in. Uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, the, I, I, I like the marketing. The marketing is good. Yeah, the, the poster is really cool. One thing that I always find interesting about horror movies is you hear a lot that people are like, oh, we had so much fun making that. And you watch the movie and mm-hmm. you're like, how? And <laughs> <laughs> one movie I always think of, it's called uh, Salo or the 120 Days of Song. Oh, yeah. 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 And there's a lot of scenes in this movie where people have to eat uh, poop. And yeah. <laughs> I was reading in the trivia that all of this was just chocolate fudge and the actors were having a straight ball doing it. And it's yeah. it's really interesting to think like, this is just like a great time to do, even though yeah. it's so horrific on screen and people sell it so well yeah. as terrifying. Yeah. 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 Making horror movies is like a weird reverse therapy. It's like acting out your most horrific fantasies and... Right. Uh, as long as you create a safe space, people will go nuts. Right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, there are obviously multiple scenes in this movie that are like insanely disgusting. Um, yeah. Anywhere from like the, uh, uh, the, when she's in the bathroom and she just blood just starts pouring out of her or the fingernail scene. I don't know what it is yeah. about. Dude, fingernails get me so much. God, when people take off their rotten fingernails, yeah. ooh, gives me the chills, man. Um, but I think the one that got me and Evan the most but for both of us was the maggot scene uh, near yeah. the end of the movie when, uh, when uh, Samantha and Riley um, are having sex and just maggots start pouring out of Samantha. Uh, I want to ask, how did you do that? Because that is one of, I, I don't understand how you did it. And I just want to like, how, what is it like trying to get a shot and a scene like that, that is so intimate, but it also so disgusting at the same time. (laughs) I'm wondering what that was like. It, it was, um, you know, all credit goes to Matt Mercer and Najara, the actors. Um, they We actually found Najara for the role through Matt Mercer. They had done a short film together. So they really uh, trusted each other and, and they really went for it in that scene. Obviously, they were really comfortable with each other. And um, yeah, it, it, it was just a matter of like choreographing the scene to the point of, you know, climax and 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 having having the maggots fall at the right time and and you know making sure that they hit in the right place and in the camera and you know i one of my favorite little touches it starts with one maggot and then it goes to more um and yeah it 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 was just a matter of like how do we uh how, how do we how do we culminate this movie in a way that is memorable and you know we 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 give the audience something they've never seen before and that was really you know the challenge in in making that movie was okay we've got a a girl this thing happens to her and this awful disease is is gonna just completely destroy her life and her existence and then you know obviously there's a there's a reveal at the end of what she's ultimately turning into but um but yeah it was it was uh I, i always looked at the fingernails, her losing her teeth, her eyes, all all the things that happened to her. I just looked at them as like little breadcrumbs, you know, leading to the the loaf of bread at the end to, to say, this, all right, this is what's happening to her. And um, it's it's always um, one of the greatest memories of my entire life is being in a movie theater, um, you know, watching. I, I've, I've seen this movie in so many theaters with so many different types of audiences all around the world. I've been to Mexico, I've been to Spain. Um, and, you know, it is just a blast to uh, experience people just oh, like losing their shit in the movie theater uh, multiple times throughout the film. So, yeah, it's 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 all about trusting the actors and them doing a good job. And then you just sprinkle sprinkle some maggots in. Yeah, this movie really builds up to this climax where she bites Nikki's like throat out 
Yeah. And then back to back scenes where she has maggots pouring out of her. Like, yeah. It's, it's an, I would love to see it in theaters. Like, mm-hmm. horror on the, on the big screen is unmatched. It, no matter yeah, what. Kind of it, yeah, it really is. is. But yeah, I always, I, I, love I always joke that the scene where she bites Alice, I'm like, if you don't know that it's a zombie movie, which hopefully people don't know it's a zombie movie when they first watch it, um, I was like, it's really weird. She just bites her neck and everyone's yeah. like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, it, uh, so there is a sequel to Contracted, um, yeah. obviously not directed by yourself. What's it yeah. like having this project? Um, and then is it sad not being, or were you even involved at, with anything about the sequel? Or is it sad not being able to be involved with continuing this story? Um, what's what's that? I've I've always personally wondered what's what's that like because like you have a director who creates these characters and yeah. this world and this story. Um, and then they kind of like don't get to be a part of its continuation. Um, yeah. What's that? What is that like as the director um, in that situation? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, it's it's challenging because you know Hollywood politics. Um, we we set out uh, to make a a fun, you know, gross little indie movie. Like I said, we made it for fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. I never envisioned that there would be a sequel. I didn't see this being a franchise. To me, this was just a one-off movie where the uh, the you know the rabbit being pulled out of the hat at the end was oh man she turned into a zombie and you know the the kind of conceptual idea for me was my movie ends where every zombie movie usually takes place. Like mm-hmm. now it's the mm-hmm. zombie outbreak and and so she's cool. going to be running through the streets of L.A. So my movie was like the prequel to the zombie outbreak. And that's how I saw it. And, um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a tragic story, unfortunately. Um, you know, I, the producers had, um, you know, this was their first movie. They had never made a movie before and, uh, they were friends of mine and they were telling me the whole time they were like, we want to get into Sundance. We want to get into all these big festivals. And I was like, good luck. You know, those are, those are tough to get into. And yeah. uh, every time we got rejected from a film festival, they were like, ah, this is a failure. You, you, you made a shitty movie. And so my, I was just kind of under the assumption that I was like, oh man, I guess I made a bad movie. And then, um, you know, they, they, you know, kept telling me like, ah, it's not going to do anything. And then when the movie came out, um, everyone was talking about it. Um, I remember waking up one of the first mornings it was released and uh, everyone was blowing up my phone saying, Hey, Howard Stern's talking about your movie. And, um, a few months after it was released, it was on Netflix. And I, I was so broke at the time. I couldn't even afford a Netflix subscription. So I didn't even know what Netflix was. And, um, so, you know, the movie in 2014 was, was the number one movie on Netflix. A little $50,000 indie film was the number one movie on the biggest streaming platform. Like it, 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 it changed my life. Like I got an agent off of that movie and I, I just couldn't believe how successful it was. And um, so when when the the guys called me saying, hey, um, the distributor IFC is interested in doing a sequel, I was like, well, I don't I don't really know what I would do for a sequel. You know, I I had always envisioned this as one movie, but um, I was like, let me let me see if I have an idea and, you know, I'll come back to you. And so I did. And I I came up with an idea that I liked and I was like, "Okay, cool, I can. I don't want to make a zombie movie. I'm not interested in that. Um, You know, let me see if I can come up with something different. And when I came to them with the idea, it was a little bigger. And I was like, Hey, I hear the movie's doing really well. So surely there's going to be more money on the table. Um, Mm -hmm. Let's do a little bit bigger movie. And they, they were like, okay, cool. So everything seemed okay at first. And then eventually as is always the case, you know, the bottom line comes into play. And I think they were trying to, um, you know, finance it with other people's money and stuff. And so eventually they came to me and they were like, Hey, the budget's going to be lower than you think. And I was like, well, okay, like, then I don't want to direct it. You know, I was like, I I started, you know, like I said, I got an agent. I started being, uh, I started talking to like Blumhouse and, you know, do talking to studios about doing bigger horror movies. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to do another micro budget, you know, no, no money indie film. So let me see if, um, you know, if, if we can, I'll write the script and we can find a different director. 
And, uh, you know, it, it just got really complicated. I, I ended up, they, the guy I wanted to direct, uh, didn't want to do it. Um, and he backed out and, and then, uh, I think they started talking to another writer and it just got really ugly. Cause like, I remember being, uh, I, I remember being called by agencies saying, Hey, we got the script for contracted too. And we want to send you some actors to talk about looking at and stuff like that. And I was like, guys, I didn't write the sequel for contracted too. And they're like, what? Your name's right here on the project. And I was like, you know, so that's why my name's not involved with it. I called the guys and I was like, look, I, I hear you're making a sequel to Contracted, but I don't want anyone thinking that this is my movie if I'm not in control of it. And um, and it's, you know, that backfired because everyone thinks I made the movie. They're like, oh, I love Contracted, too. And I'm like, cool, I'm glad you like it. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, I, I haven't spoken about this publicly, but uh, the director of Contracted 2 and I started off on really good terms. Like we kind of had this like fun, like, hey, you're directing the sequel to my movie. And, you know, um, you know, you're raising my kid, so to speak. And uh, and and it was a, a playful thing. And then when the movie came out, I had to kind of draw a hard line in the sand of like, I have nothing to do with this movie. And the producers and I were not on good terms. And that guy took it as uh, his name's Josh. He's a really nice guy. Um, he took it as me, like kind of, you know, saying fuck you to his movie. And I was like, Oh no, 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 no. So I actually reached out to him, uh, on social media not too long ago and was like, Hey man, I, I hope there's no bad blood between us. Like I have no, no ill will toward you. So we're, we're on good terms, which is, which is good. But, and he just had a new movie release. So shout out to him. Um, and, and yeah, so it, it was kind of a tragic story. You know, it's like one of those classic stories of uh, a bunch of, a bunch of young kids. Cause I was 24 when I made contracted and, yeah. Uh, you know, we were just a bunch of kids making a horror movie and then suddenly money gets involved and everyone starts getting greedy. And and I was just trying to make movies and, and build my career. So it's it's unfortunate how it unfolded. But, um, you know, who knows? I, I, I hear horror stories of, you know, what happened with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how those filmmakers got fucked out of money. And, you know, Wes Craven famously had issues with New Line Studios on Nightmare on Elm Street, but he eventually came back and did, uh, you know, New Nightmare. So. Who knows? Maybe there'll be a happy ending one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it, from I, I haven't checked out the movie itself, but from what I even read from the synopsis, it sounds like he goes in a very not like different direction than I would have expected. I mean, I guess it's just a different direction than I would have expected of like yeah. him hunting down the people who started it. That's yeah. just not what something yeah. I would expect. Um, no. But I do love Contracted, um, and I now I want to get into my favorite of your films, um, which is, I don't know if you're, it's your most recent project, um, but Josie with uh, yeah. Sophie Turner and Dylan McDermott. Um, yeah. Dermot, I don't, I can't remember. Ever yeah, remember Dylan it. McDermott. Dylan yeah. McDermott. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to ask um is like this is your what seems like your first movie with like really big like well-known like obviously sophie turner has done like yeah. the x-men movies um dylan game of thrones. Mc, yeah, game yeah. Of thrones. that little that little tv show called game <laughs> yeah. of thrones um and uh also dylan mcdermott uh i know him best from uh clove hitch killer um yeah yeah he did that right after josie yeah which is one of my favorites i first um, saw him in american horror story yeah a lot Murder of people House. Know from american horror story yeah but he's also done like he was in perks of being a wallflower olympus has yeah. fallen steel magnolias yeah. um so right off the bat yeah, he's been active for a long time yeah you have two like very successful very like well-known actors how what working with like bigger people was there any difference between like working uh with kind of like on uh, more of an indie crew and then moving to like this bigger like hollywood actors or was there any difference there um for you yeah i don't know if you guys are rap fans but as notorious big said more money more problems um <laughs> it's it's uh yeah i mean when you're dealing with famous people you're dealing with agents and you're dealing with um you know, yeah, I mean, Sophie was on the biggest TV show in the world at the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, so everything we did, we had to kind of like run by HBO and make sure it was OK with her agents and the TV network. And um, yeah, it, it was it was an absolutely different experience. It was a different beast. Uh, Josie, it was originally called Huntsville. 
Um, it was a blacklist script. The blacklist is um, a list of the best screenplays in Hollywood that haven't been turned into movies yet um, as voted on by executives and studios in Hollywood. So it was a very prestigious screenplay. Um, and uh, it was the first time I directed something I didn't write. And um, yeah, I mean, it was it was very much a product and result that entire movie uh, of the success of Contracted. You know, my agent at the time uh, represented the writer and and, you know, they were like, hey, we you know, we hear you don't want to do horror for a minute. And, um, you know, we have this screenplay and uh, you're from Arkansas and this is set. It was originally set in Florida. We I, I appreciate that you guys like the movie. The movie was extremely challenging to make. It was um you know, uh, the, the, the final film is not necessarily reflective of what I set out to make. Um, we had to make a lot of last minute changes, which is challenging. Um, originally before Sophie Turner was cast, we had Anya Taylor joy, um, hmm. uh, who's, you know, going to be Furiosa. Yeah. Um, it, it is so fucking weird to me. Um, when I first cast Anya Taylor joy, the witch hadn't even come out yet. It had just premiered oh, wow. at Sundance. Yeah. It just premiered at Sundance. And I was like, this is the actress um, you know, I was like, she's going to be one of the biggest movie stars in the world and no one would finance the movie. They were like, we don't know who this girl is. And I was like, it doesn't matter that you don't know who she is. she's going to be one of the biggest movie stars <laughs> in the world. And no one listened to me. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we, we ended up, uh, she, she went and did M. Night Shyamalan's movie split. And, um, and, and that became the number one movie in the world. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we were re extremely fortunate to get Sophie. We were extremely fortunate to get Dylan and, um, yeah, they, they were, they were champions of the project, which was great. It, it, it's just, you know, it's Hollywood is a very challenging business. And so, yeah, when, when there's uh, blood in the water, the sharks will swim. So it's, it's a, yeah. it was a very, very different beast. And I, it was a big learning lesson for me. It taught me a lot about what I want to do moving forward and what I don't want to do. Um, but yeah, very, very different experience coming from making, you know, $50,000 horror movies to, uh, you know, multi-million dollar indie films with a lot of, uh, I, I remember one of the biggest culture shocks I ever had was, um, so Sophie's obviously covered in tattoos in the movie. And, mm -hmm. um, when she, you know, because she, she's not, she doesn't live in LA. So she would be flown over from, from the UK and come to LA. And when she was getting, you know, when we were shooting and stuff, she would still be going to like red carpets and she would still be going to like, um, you know, out and about around town and she had paparazzi and I'm not used to that. So suddenly <laughs> there's paparazzi photos of my actress covered in tattoos and they're like, Oh my God, Sophie Turner's got all these new tattoos. And I'm like, I don't want people seeing this yet. So it, it was just, it was just weird, weird culture. Yeah. Shock. I was like, Holy shit. I have to worry about paparazzi now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is, different this is a different genre than we we and we've seen from you so far um in yeah. your filmography this is definitely goes down more the road of kind of like thriller slash drama um, yeah it's more drama which i i personally really enjoyed i and as you said this is the first one that you did did where you didn't write the script um and yeah. i thought you did an excellent job here i've I think Thanks. you, uh, the directing style of this film was amazing. Um, and, uh, I, I think me and Evan both really enjoyed, well, obviously for our listeners, spoilers ahead. If you haven't seen yeah. Jesse, um, we, we want to get into like the last 20 minutes because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really what made the film for me is that yeah. last 20 minutes, basically from where, um, he goes to uh he goes to fish and he sees yeah. his boat um yeah. that Marcus had like defaced and destroyed yeah to the end of the movie I was yeah. like locked in like yeah, cool. oh my god I loved it um That's awesome. and I want to ask like obviously plot twists um for it to be an effective plot twist it has to be done right there's obviously yeah. movies where you get plot twists that don't feel as effective because either they have been, it's too predictable or yeah. um, it's just not a plot twist that has that much shock to it. Like you're like, Oh, what? Who saw that coming? Yeah. It's not that exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I think you did such a good job here of j teasing it just a little bit, like giving us some like breadcrumbs but not enough cool. to where you can figure it out until yeah. that final scene where after Dylan McDermott, Hank passes out 
and you go back, you flash back to the uh, Josie like watching her dad and watching Hank like basically yeah. kill her dad. Um, yeah. uh, I won. We and I think Evan was wondering. This yeah, too. What's I it like? I texted Trey the moment this movie ended, and I was like, I want to have a conversation about plot twists. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, That's awesome. What's it like trying to direct and trying to give the audience just a little bit, but not enough to where it like will lose its payoff, and having it having to like build it up to this big payoff, and then having that payoff be so effective and so like um, satisfying. Um, what was that like having to direct that? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. It's very kind. Um, I, you know, I think the Rotten Tomato scores would disagree with you, but uh, some some people don't them, like but... the movie. Yeah, some people don't like it. Some people thought it was predictable. Um, I, I, I'm a. I first and foremost, I love slow burn movies. I think that movies where you invest in the characters and you are for you know like even going back to the texas chainsaw massacre like the texas chainsaw massacre is just a bunch of kids walking around abandoned houses in texas and gas stations and mm -hmm. you know it's it's um i i love movies that kind of like force you to wonder where this is going and then once it starts to reveal itself as you said you're kind of locked in and you're like oh shit I'm, I'm a little bit along for the ride and now it's like a roller coaster where i'm like i just see it's going uphill and we're gonna go and uh, when I first read the script for, for Huntsville, now Josie, um, that that was what, you know, that that's what sold me on it was I was like, oh, wow, this is a really, you know, grounded middle America story that at the end is effectively a revenge movie. And I thought that was really cool. That was something I hadn't seen before. I was like, this is a, re a revenge movie dis disguised as a sleepy Southern drama and that was something that was unique and something that was interesting. And I, I, I was like, I don't think people will expect that from me in my career. Um, so I thought it would keep keep people on their toes. And and in terms of like, um, you know, kind of writing that line, it's it's a delicate balance. You know, it's it's um, it's it's a matter of uh, obviously, as always, the performances with the characters. You know, I think um, I, I, I Dylan has been acting longer than I've been alive. And, um, you know, working with him, I learned so much. And, you know, I actually think Josie is, is in, in my opinion, if I can, you know, pat myself on the back and pat him, like, I think it's one of his best performances. I think he's, he does a great job in the movie. Um, it's, it's definitely a kind of character that you don't see from him uh, very often. And um, Sophie, I think, does a really good job uh, of, of kind of playing this mysterious character. Obviously, Sophie just has, you know, she's one of the most famous people on the planet, um, you know, she, she commands the camera and, and especially when she's got, you know, uh, crazy bleach blonde hair. Um, I'll never forget the first time we posted a photo of her with her blonde hair. The entire internet was like, Oh my God, is she becoming a Targaryen and game of Thrones and you know, this and that. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of game of Thrones fans were like pissed at me for dyeing her hair. And, um, I, I even put it in my letterbox bio. I'm like, I'm that asshole that dyed Sansa Stark's hair blonde. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's weird, but, um, you know, I going to plot twists, um, uh, Scream was one of the first movies I ever remember seeing where uh, I was a kid, way too young to see it. It was my favorite yeah. movie for the longest time. And I was like, holy shit, that is a plot twist. And then I saw The Sixth Sense and I was like, holy shit, that's a plot twist. And so I, I'm obsessed with plot twists. I, I think that a good plot twist is one of the greatest things you can have uh, in, in the cinema, you know, I, to me, it's, it's like the equivalent of going to a rock and roll concert and someone just shredding a guitar solo on the guitar, you know, it's like, ah, oh, that's what you come for. And, um, yeah. and, and Josie to me, a movie like Josie is just building up to where's this all going? Where's this, where's this going to lead? And, and yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the last 20 so minutes of the movie are my favorite as well, because it's, it really just ratchets up the tension and, and the, the stuff around the dinner table is just so tense and mm -hmm. um, shooting those scenes um, are some of my most fondest memories of, of making that movie. And I just remember loving being between Dylan and Sophie 
and and just watching them go back and forth and just feeling like a kid in a candy store. I was like, oh man, this is tense, and she's crying and he's crying, and I was like, oh my god, this is this is you know insane. And just trying to capture that on camera, you know, it's like I I have my own issues with what I did directorially, but like it's it's hard as a filmmaker to want to even touch the camera because you're just like, oh, I just want to set the camera up and watch these two great actors just do what they do, you know? And um, it's, it's, it's kind of an honor to just sit there and watch them perform. But then you have to remember like, Oh shit, it's your job to be the orchestrator and, you know, tell them what to do and how to do it. But um, yeah, it, it was, uh, it, 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 it all credit to the actors, all credit to um, Anthony Ragnone, uh, the the writer um, he just did such a great job and you know that was I think it was his first screenplay and it was on the blacklist and everyone loved it so it was um it, it was it was scary to me to be handed a screenplay that everyone was like hey we love this screenplay don't fuck it up <laughs> so um, yeah. you know that yeah. that was uh that was scary and that actually leads me into I mean the biggest question that I wanted to ask today uh, so you mentioned that scene that final scene at the table between um, Hank and Josie. Um, and you obviously have Hank who is, he's, he's very like, uh, and like you said, this is very out of character for Dylan McDermott to play this yeah. kind of reserved character. Um, you, we, I, I, at least the stuff I've seen him in, I don't see him do this much. Um, yeah. He obviously has a lot of trauma in his past, he's very like reserved, keeping to himself, maybe a slight alcoholic. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a little bit of drinking uh, problem. And, and then you have Josie, this, this kind of mysterious presence, I want to say, that just kind of shows up into his life. And throughout the movie is kind of starting to bring him out of his shell. Um, and... Uh, and it all kind of builds to that final conversation between them at the dinner table. Um, and I wanted to ask, like, what was it like to direct that where they are both giving it their all as far as like performing goes? And they are they, they it feels like it doesn't even feel like they're Dylan McDermott and Sophie Turner. Like it's Hank yeah, and cool. Josie, like yeah. having this conversation. Um, and I wanted to ask, like, what's it like directing, uh, specifically that scene, um, where it's so much less focused on like horror, where it's, you're focusing on like how it looks and trying to get a scare and, and a yeah. reaction out of people, but more focusing on these characters. Um, what was it like directing that final scene where like you have the whole movie building up to this scene and it is so important um, and you, I mean, I think you killed it. I, the payoff oh, is you. excellent and I love it. Um, what yeah, was it like directing fantastic. that scene specifically? Thank you. Um, well, yeah, again, thank you. That, that is the highest compliment. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it was, as I said, it was, it was a little nerve wracking, um, because, you know, especially coming from $50,000 horror movies, I was like, man, am I qualified to be here? Um, Anthony and I were constantly stepping aside um on set and just kind of looking at each other and we're like man we've got two really famous really talented actors who are just chewing up the scenery and just acting their asses off and um i mean there were definitely moments where i was behind the monitor watching them act and i was just like getting a little choked up and and kind of you know really feeling the intensity and feeling the emotion and and it you know i've i've been really fortunate to work with some some talented actors even even in the indie space you know um it's it's acting is just a tough 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 gig you have to be so vulnerable you have to be so raw and you have to tap into so many different emotions and you know we we tend to really kind of put on a pedestal these famous actors and the character actors the supporting actors in Josie are also just phenomenal like um the uh the canadians next door um mm -hmm. the the neighbors uh the wife is in shutter island and and kurt fuller her husband is just in everything he's in scary movies and so many great films so yeah. being surrounded by all of these great actors was just extremely extremely intimidating like the uh uh lombardo who plays um 
Romero in in the movie. He's been in a ton of great shit. Um, it's 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 just all of them were just so incredible. And so being on set with all of these great actors, I was just constantly feeling like the odd man out. Where I'm like, I don't know if I'm qualified to be here. And when we got to the dinner table scene, um, it, it it was you know especially in in a movie like Josie, you know. I, I felt naked to be honest with you, because like, and, and when you direct horror, you, you have the, the effects, you have the music, you have all of the things to lean on and try to scare people or gross them out or make them feel uncomfortable. And with Josie, it is simply just, you know, the, the performances and, and the writing. And it's like, you are just leaning into that and, and saying, go along with this ride with these characters. And it, it was very much, a uh, 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 an exercise in restraint, you know, cause like I said, as, as a director, you, you want to be, um, you know, showing off with the camera sometimes, but I, as I've gotten older, I've learned, it's like, that's not what it's about. It's, it's about telling the story and where you need to put the camera to get the best, uh, you know, best emotion from the actors and, and tell the story the best way. And so, you know, on that, that, that whole kitchen, that whole motel, that that was a set um and and so like we had to build hank's apartment um on a sound stage so we're in a sound stage it's a very artificial environment and then you're watching the camera and they are just making it so real and you just realize like wow this is why they get paid the money they do this is why they are famous like they are just world-class actors and yeah it's it's humbling it's humbling to be in the presence of great actors, just chewing up the scenery and, and giving great performances and tapping into these emotions. And then as soon as you call cut, it's like, Ooh, all right, well, um, you know, let's, let's redo it. Let's, let's go again. And, you know, they go back to their, their dressing rooms or whatever, and you get back to work and you're like, shit, I got to take a moment and, and reflect on what we need to do and how do we make that better? And, and that was, that was always a, an interesting realization of like, I'm like, okay, that was really great. How do we make that better? You know, we, there's a ton of footage somewhere on a hard drive in this world of just Sophie and Dylan acting their asses off at that dinner table that, you know, you only get to choose one shot per scene, you know, that you're like, okay, this is the one. And it's like, there's, they gave tons of great material. So it was, it was a blessing as a director to have that much, you know, stuff to work with and, and to, to pull from. But yeah, it's like I said, it's a testament to how great the screenplay was, how great Anthony did uh, in, in telling the story and, and how great of a job they did as the actors. It was, it was um, really just uh, humbling to be a part of. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Was this a, sorry, I'm really, I'm genuinely really curious about this. Was this a scene that you shot towards the end of the shoot? Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. So you could like let Dylan and Sophie build some chemistry strongly. Yeah. So that this scene felt more authentic. Yeah. I don't know if we had the luxury of like designing it that way, but we, right. we, yeah, cause we, we, we were on a sound stage, So we were at the mercy of when those stages were available and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if I, if I remember correctly, I think that was like Sophie's last day on set. And then wow. um, we we had a, a few more days with Dylan specifically. Um, I think the stuff where he finds the boat might have been the last day of shooting because um, we had to shoot that lake. So so the entire movie was shot in Los Angeles. Like it was set in Florida, but we shot it in L.A. Wow. And even the stuff where he's like out fishing in the lake and stuff like that's all in L.A. And I had to make it not look like L.A., which is yeah. one of the biggest challenges of my career. And um, ironically, the scene where he finds the fishing boat the truck died. That was the last shot of the movie and um, uh, or the last shot of the shoot. And um, so on the last take, the truck dies. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like we, we just need this one shot. And Dylan's like, well, I'll just put it bark and we'll just walk it. We'll, we'll make it work. So the truck is dead in that scene and he's just walking up and we had to make it work. But so, uh, you know, on movies, something's always going wrong, but yeah, we were fortunate enough to kind of build it to a crescendo where I think that dinner table scene was Sophie's last day. So, so it was kind of the culmination really cool. of the shoot. Yeah. 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 One of the things me and Trey were talking about, we actually just talked about this movie a couple of weeks ago, but the, you don't really know where this movie's going, building to this dinner table scene. We both were like, this is kind of like Lolita, the Stanley Kubrick yeah. Uh, yeah. film. And we were like, is this going to turn into this, like really creepy, like grooming movie? And then it yeah. totally throws a curveball. Exactly. Yeah. And I was think that that's a... why, 
Evan, no, uh, I think that's why it both it got me and Evan both so yeah. much that twist is because Lolita, we're de- currently on the pod, we're doing a Kubrick deep dive, so every oh, week cool. we're yeah. doing talking reviewing two <clears throat> Kubrick movies, and I think it's because Lolita was so fresh on our mind. Mm-hmm, um, we yeah. were both like, "Oh, is this another creepy grooming movie?" And then I think that's why the twist got both yeah. of us is because that's what you're expecting the whole time is there's yeah. like they are friends and it's this really like nice sweet relationship, but yeah. there again is that like weird like you're always on edge because you're it, 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 I don't know if it's like we were expecting that because you're a horror like that's yeah. like your type of vibe. Or if it's just like that's what you're expecting when it's an older like man who lives by himself and then a younger high schooler girl who lives by herself. That's just what you're expecting. But I think that's why it caught both of us so off guard is because that's what we're expecting. And then it just goes into a completely different direction. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's interesting. I've seen a lot of critics that, you know, didn't like the movie and, and they... I think they wanted more of that. They were like, ah, I wanted it to be sleazier and I wanted it to be, you know, more, more of a erotic thriller and this and that. And I'm like, I think y'all are just perps. That's really weird. Um, <laughs> yeah. We didn't like Lolita. We watched it and we were like, yeah, this was hard to even, Trey didn't even finish it. Like, we I like, didn't. Yeah. It's hard to even get through. I was so yeah. uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, screw the critics. I, that's why I don't, yeah. that's why I never trust Rotten Tomatoes. Not even that. Yeah, you shouldn't. It's it because first of all, it's not even like it, the credits gave this movie an eighty five percent. It's like eighty five percent of critics would recommend this movie. It's not even yeah. an actual score yeah. of the movie. It's like I recommend yeah, it's an this. Aggregate. Yeah. And that's why I always go to um either the letterbox score. I feel like the letterbox sure. score is always super accurate. Except when sure. it comes to horror, sometimes yeah. the letterbox score on horror movies is super <laughs> low, and then you watch it and you're like, yeah. this was great. Yeah. Um, or, uh, the IMDB score. I feel like the IMDB score is always a good place to go. Um, yeah, I agree. But, um, before we get into our game where we're drafting the most fucked up horror movies, I just wanted to thank you, Eric, for how open you've been about no. like the filmmaking process for all three of these films and what goes into them. I mean, this has been awesome. I think this has been cool. more it's been than really fun. me and Evan could have ever hoped for. So I just yeah. want to thank you for that. Um, and being so open and willing to talk about your own personal movies. Um, and I, I just want to thank you. This has been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you guys. I, I love making movies. I love talking about movies, whether they're mine, whether they're other movies, like it's, it's, yeah, it's just a blast to, you know, this is why I do it. I, I, I love telling stories and I like talking about stories. So, so thanks for watching the movies. Thanks for enjoying them. And, and thanks for sharing your feedback. That's, that's the best part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, one question before oh, we get yeah. into this: yeah. How long did it take to shoot the turtle race scene? <laughs> 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 did you have to get trained turtles for this? Uh, well, we did. We did have like um, turtle wranglers, um, and uh, we we yeah. I think uh, if I remember correctly, my art director um, uh, Liz she she worked on Madison County with me. Um, she was in charge of wrangling the turtles. Um, the the turtles sequence uh it took some time dylan dylan was a little impatient with the turtles um but um but yeah that that was that was honestly one of the more challenging things i've ever done as a director i was like how the hell do i get these turtles to do what i want how do i shoot this yeah um i'm still not really happy with that scene but um but you know you're you're dealing with turtles and i mean god bless dylan he he, yeah, he, he literally acted alongside like five different scenes with just turtles. And it's just like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had to so know funny. because I'm always curious about like, you see little quotes and it's like dogs making movies. You have to CGI their tails because they're wagging too yeah. much for their, because they're too happy to be on camera. And you're just like <laughs> yeah. making, making scenes with animals must be really frustrating because it's not like you can just tell them what to do unless they're insanely well-trained. And a turtle is definitely not one of those. Yeah, working with Magus was way easier than working with turtles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's get into our game for today. So we are going to do a draft. Um, sure. We're going to do snake style. 
So uh, we, it's going to be, Eric, you're going to have first pick since you're the guest. Um, All right. And then, Evan, you get third pick, and Solid. I yeah. will take the second pick. Um, really? So how this will work, Eric, you'll take one, and then it'll go to me. Evan, you'll take two, and then we'll yeah. go back. Um, and the topic is most fucked up movies. And um, we will uh, put up, I'll, t- I'll probably make a graphic and put it up on my Twitter so people can vote. And if, listeners, you can leave us uh, a comment on this video to see, to give your opinion on who you think won and made the best list of the most fucked up movies. Um, yeah. And yeah, let's just get into it. Eric, you get first pick. What is your one, one pick of what you think is the most fucked up movie? I mean, we've already said it. It's hard to, it's hard to beat solo. I mean, solo is just a brutal. Yeah. 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 Who enjoys watching that? Yeah. I did not enjoy watching it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. I think Solo has to be there. Yeah. Um, I have second pick. I'm going to take one that is probably the hardest I've ever, that took me the longest to get through is the Poughkeepsie tapes. Uh, mm, that's one, a good one yeah. that still to this day, I haven't been able to r- rate um, j- literally just because like, I loved it because of what it did. Like horror is supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. It's supposed yeah. to scare you. And it did such a good job at that for me. But I also hated the experience so much because of how fucked yeah. up it is. Uh, but yeah, that's my number one. Evan, what's your yeah. one pick? Uh, first off, are we doing just like, you want to do like three rounds? Uh, I was thinking we do five picks or we can do three okay, picks. five picks. Yeah, we'll see where it I goes. feel like there's a lot uh, to choose from. Yeah, my my yeah. pick is Martyrs, the French uh, Ooh, horror film. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, I've seen this movie four times now, not even by my own choice, because I find this movie extremely disturbing, and I yeah, really, really good. have a hard time getting through it. I've shown this movie to people, that's why I rewatch it, but I think this movie is so brutal, yet it has the craziest ending and third act yeah. when it gets into yeah. what this secret society is building on and what they're trying yeah. to figure out. No spoilers because go watch it if you haven't seen it. Yeah. It has an extremely cool ending that really gets you. It's a very thought provoking film for how crazy it is because I, I know a lot of these fucked up horror movies tend to be fucked up for the sake of being fucked up but i think martyrs really pushes into thought-provoking territory so yeah i have to take martyrs fun fact um the first movie i ever almost directed like as as a studio director um was the martyrs remake for really oh yeah i got really close to directing that and i'm kind of glad i didn't because i love the original and and i wouldn't want people to hate me for you know ruining its legacy but yeah i yeah. love i love the original martyrs yeah <laughs> i was looking into the martyrs remake and i saw that the director decided to make it pg-13 because he didn't like uh. violence which i thought was a very <laughs> odd choice for a movie like martyrs when that's kind of the whole thing the plot is based around yeah right. uh, but yeah that's like the, my the least, original that's my least favorite thing is when directors decide to make horror movies pg-13 you restrict yeah. yourself so much to what you can show and what you can do. And don't get me wrong. There are some horror films out there that are PG-13 and still yeah, work really sure. well. Yeah. Like Paranormal Activity, I believe, is PG-13. And that movie is... Ter- I mean, it terrifies me, personally. Uh, and But, like, when you come... Like, the one that always comes to mind, Megan, which came out last year. Kind of a mm-hmm. slasher, like, campy vibe. It would have done so much better, I think. And I know, Evan, you've seen, like, the director's cut yeah. that's rated R. And I f- still feel like it would have done so much better as a rated R horror movie um, than as a PG-13. Um, yeah. It's usually the studio. Most directors don't want to make PG-13 horror movies. Yeah. It's usually a studio because they think yeah. they'll make more money. Yeah, yeah it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but uh, Evan, number two yeah. pick. My next pick, I think, it's not my second favorite uh, I want to take audition. No, Tekashi, mm. God, I was audition about to take that. Is a Audition's extremely great. cool slow burn f- drama until the third act, where it is fucking 
crazy. I yeah. had nightmares, and I was laying in bed for like two or three days after I watched it of the girl putting the needles into his head, and he's she's like, ticka, 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 ticka. I was like oh, so creeped out by that. I love audition. It's really, really yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, all Trey, right. what's your next pick? Uh, for my second pick, I am gonna go have have to go with uh one lars von trier film that it took me like four times of watching it to actually finish i feel like you could take every lars von trier film on this list but um this could this one took me like four times of actually watching it to finish and get through it (laughs) uh and that's antichrist yeah yeah Uh, it that is such a hard movie to watch not yeah, because brutal. it's i mean you do have some insanely graphic scenes but yeah. just because the relationship between the husband and wife is so toxic and yeah. terrible it's just god that movie is so hard to watch for me it too much genital mutilation for my taste <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah, it's a rough one it's, it's so rough hard one. um all right eric second pick for you what are you choosing um human centipede 2 Oh, great pick. It's a good pick. I yeah. yeah. Do you enjoy the Human Centipede movies? I like the second one. The second one, yeah. um I, I mean they're they're brutal. They're just brutal films, but I yeah. I like the black and white in the second one. Um I like that it's got a very meta, you know, self awareness yeah. to it. And um yeah, I, I think it's just really it's unsettling and um yeah, I I I, I I, I think that, you know, I, I, I'm also kind of like an IFC fan because they released Contracted. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think the Human Centipede movie, I just love how, like, culturally they just, like, permeated our culture and everyone's yeah. like, oh, it's wow, super... when you see that movie, it's just like, yeah, all right, that's that's twisted and messed up. Yeah, yeah. people just know it with that with you just saying yeah. the name. And then, I mean, there's the yeah. South Park episode. On, oh, which my is gosh, I was hilarious. about to shout that out. Yeah. Do you the want South me is... to eat the cuttlefish? Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's really, really great. Oh, my God. Uh, Yeah, I love how meta the second and third Human Centipede movies are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, Eric, since it's you also get a uh, third pick, what is your third mm, pick? Hmm. Inside, the French French horror movie. I want to talk about Inside. Yeah, I like Inside a lot. I okay. like French horror movies. French horror movies yeah. are brutal martyrs uh okay brief spoilers for inside i i watched this movie last year i think and i thought that it was creative and fun but i hated how stupid the cops were in this movie that they went into this (laughs) house one by one and died one by one for like 40 minutes straight i was like what the fuck is going on yeah. Uh, I think the the ending on the stairs is crazy. It it, it has yeah. great gore. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, a good revenge movie. Yeah. yeah. For my third pick, I'm I here. This is one that not many people would pick here, but it was the first horror one. It was the first horror movie I ever watched, and I didn't sleep that night because of this movie. <laughs> Uh, little story. I watched this movie. I was at uh, Christian summer camp. We were All at right. this summer camp called Move, where basically we they would like rent out the campus of OSU, Oregon State University, for a week, and you would like go. You would stay in the dorms. It was I was think it was like going into my freshman year of high school, and you would stay in the dorms. And it was a lot different. It was really cool because they were like, okay, basically you have to be in the dorm building by like this time. But after that, you don't really, you can do whatever the fuck you want. So we'd go mattress surfing in the hallways. They had TV rooms. Yeah. We'd, we'd watch movies. And I walked in and they were watching it. And it's the mm. remake with Bill Skarsgård. Yeah. And I'm going to take it, uh, the remake. First of all, I'm not a huge fan of remakes. I feel like uh, Andy Muschietti did a great job with both of the It remakes. I have a blast with them. I know they get a lot of hate, but I love them. Um, And I'm taking it specifically because of the opening scene of that film. Georgie getting his arm chopped off. 
I was <laughs> like, ah, what the fuck? Why are we watching this, guys? This is terrible. Um, and that was like my first ever horror movie that I watched. So I'm going to take That's it. That's amazing. Um, I remember the- I was in the theaters and I don't remember what movie I was seeing, but they played the first scene of it before it. And it was that whole entire scene up until when Georgie gets his arm bitten off. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I need to see this movie now. Yeah. That's amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. Bill Skarsgård did an so unbelievable good. job as Pennywise. Yeah. That was um, great. All right, Evan. Yeah. Going over my next, with your my next pick fourth. is yet again another French horror movie called Angst. This is a mm. uh, serial killer movie about a guy it is narrated by him so you get into the mind of a serial killer and he is stoic as fuck for the entire movie he elicits zero emotion as he tortures a family yeah it's, it's a brutal movie. brutal i watched this over the summer it's really good yeah angst is cool then, uh yeah for yeah pick. my fourth pick hmm Oh, this is a film directed by the director of The Babadook. This is called The Nightingale. This is another, Mm. it's a revenge movie. It's not a horror film per se, but it's about a woman who, uh, her baby is murdered in front of her. It is brutal. It is brutal. And it's really interesting. Uh, It deals with like relations between Americans and indigenous it's really, really cool. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's it's rough watch. The first half hour is really painful, but it's really good. All right. So uh, with my fourth pick, um, I would feel like this draft was a failure if I didn't get one of his films up here. I am going to take Ari Aster's Midsommar, um, mm, one of the most one. disturbing and shocking openings to a movie ever um and one of my personal favorites um um yeah all right eric that now it is saying i'm sending it over to you with your fourth and your fifth pick fourth and fifth jesus um i'm i'm gonna work off of your ari aster um I, I love hereditary hereditary yeah. um, i don't i don't so know th- i don't know that it's uh, yeah i don't know that it's one of the most like disturbing horrific i i can i, I mean can go there the pole scene alone yeah yeah the pole or scene's brutal self, like, yeah the piano piano yeah yeah um, it, it's crazy yeah I, I like i like ari's work a lot um and then my fifth one um i think maybe the evil dead remake the evil dead remake's pretty brutal <sighs> so good. w yeah, a little a little chainsaw to the face and raining oh. blood and um the, yeah, the not not as brutal lick. as like solo. Yeah, the box cutter is nasty. Like I, I I have a lot of fun with those. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a that that's one I, I'm going to tell a little story. Uh when I was I was 13 when this movie came out and my uncle was in town. He lived across the country and uh he pulled my brother who's 3 years older than me out of school to take him to go see this movie but he didn't take me and i was like genuinely distraught about it that he didn't take me if i was 13 and watched that i probably would have been very upset by it and when i went to go see evil dead rise in theaters i texted my brother and i was like it's finally time to watch an evil dead movie in theaters and he texts me back he's like that is so funny (laughs) like yeah evil dead is it's crazy like it opens with a girl being lit on fire and then her head blown off by a shotgun yeah. and then it's it's yeah. just so dark and brutal like evil dead rise yeah. i think has a lot more of that lightheartedness not lightheartedness mm-hmm. but uh that evil dead 2 has you know like you've mm-hmm. got the eyeball scene where the eyeball goes and she chokes on it to death like yeah but yeah. evil dead 2013 is just like a hateful movie brutal. it's so yeah. brutal yeah. i love it yeah i love it and hereditary right. Evil oh, so Dead good. rankings. I think Evil Dead 2013 is at the bottom because that's part of what I love so much about the Evil Dead movies mm. is that kind of like charm and levity that mm-hmm. Sam Raimi was able to put in the originals. And I and Evil Dead Rise, I think is at number three for me in my Evil Dead rankings. 
just because I feel like they were able, uh, Lee Cronin was able to recapture a little bit of that kind of like goofy goofiness, yeah. which is why for my fifth pick, I'm going to take Evil Dead Rise solely based okay. on the cheese grater scene where <laughs> God, dude, God, I, I like, I audibly, I was watching it by myself and I audibly went, Oh, and then I rewinded yeah. it to watch it again <laughs> because it's just, Oh, that scene is so gnarly and I love it so much. I it's wish they so didn't put it in the trailer. Yeah, they put I, I wish they would have gone. I wish they would have gone more on it. Like I, I wanted more cheese grater. Yeah, I did too. Honestly, that's the thing. I thought that the scene where she swallows the glass was way worse, yeah. and I thought the cheese grater could have been worse. But it's still yeah. like it puts it into your head of how awful that would feel. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Uh, and then Evan, your uh, yeah, I believe your final pick. My final and fifth pick. I want to take a Gaspar Noé film. Mm. This is a French director yet again, because the French are just fucked up people in when it yeah. comes to horror movies. I, I, I'm trying to pick between climax and irreversible. I think irreversible is, uh, yeah. it, it's just devastating. That's a challenging movie. Yeah. I, I knew, uh, about the scene at the end of this movie before i watched it and i still watched it i don't know if you know trey but this this movie features a nine minute single scene single camera take rape scene cool. where it's only it's it's full on the faces in a tunnel it's brutal yeah. it's really it really brutal cool really it's sounds terrible like my type of movie um man. Yeah. This movie is told in <laughs> this movie's told in reverse though. It's really cool. So it works its way back to that and the rest of the movie is like the ending is the the revenge or the beginning is the revenge and it works its way back yeah. to the start. It's really cool. And the first yeah. 20 minutes of this movie is crazy. Gaspar Noé was taking cocaine before filming this scene because it was so intensive because it's a 20 minute single take. And it's through this nightclub and he plays, I was looking at the IMDb trivia, he plays an audio through the speakers at like 23 hertz or something like that. And it's something you can't hear, but your brain recognizes. So it makes you feel very, very unsettled. And this opening scene is just magnificent. It's crazy. It's brutal. It's weird, creepy. Yeah, Irreversible is a very interesting movie that I don't want to watch again, but I think is expertly yeah. made. It's yeah, if you've seen it, Eric, you like the the fire extinguisher. Yeah, I've seen it like once. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like there's a scene with a fire extinguisher hitting someone's face, and it's one take, but like, it, or it looks like one take, but like it caves someone's face in, and there's there's no yeah. visible cuts, but it's it's really 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 crazy to watch. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. but yeah, <laughs> my list is just full of French horror movies because they're yeah. they're so fucked up. <laughs> um, so if you listeners want to vote on who you think won um, this draft, uh, leave a comment down below. Um, yeah. Eric, again to go over the draft picks. Eric drafted uh, Salo, or I, th I can't remember, or a hundred and twenty days of Sodom. Yep, that one. Yeah. Um, Human Centipede 2, Inside, Hereditary, and Evil Dead, the 2013 version. Um, I drafted the Poughkeepsie Tapes, Antichrist, It, Midsommar, and Evil Dead Rise. And Evan drafted Martyrs, Audition, Angst, um, The Nightingale, and um, I can't read my own handwriting. What was that last one? Irreversible. 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 Thank yeah. you um yeah so again great lineup yeah vote yeah. down below um who you think won the draft with for the most fucked up movies um and uh eric is there anything any upcoming projects that you want to promote before we finish up here anything we can be looking forward to 
Nothing that I've publicly announced yet. I'm I'm working, like I said earlier, uh, my wife and I are writing and, and producing together and uh, we're working on a couple of horror projects. She's writing a TV show that, um, you know, is going to be a little bit of a departure for me once I get to it. But um, but yeah, I, I, I want to do more horror. Like I said, I haven't made a, a horror movie since Contracted. So I've, I've oh, been yeah. really kind of itching to get back into the genre and uh, yeah. hopefully hopefully there's more horror in the future. Yeah, everybody look out for uh, more horror movies from Eric England. Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, that was um, yeah. thanks for having me, guys. It's been an absolute honor and a blast to have you on and talk about your films. Um, uh, listeners, if you want to find me and Evan on our socials, Evan is Evan0567 on Letterboxd, and I am Trey the Film Noob, basically everywhere, TikTok, Twitter, Letterboxd. Um, check out... Uh, on Tuesday, we will be reviewing Logan, debatably one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. And then next Friday, it will be our only single movie Kubrick episode. We will be reviewing The Shining as we dive deeper into his filmography. One of my personal favorites. It's my second favorite yeah. film of all time. Um, so we will be doing that. Um, and thank you for listening to The Average Film Enjoyer today. And we hope you have a grand rest of your day.